were in Titus chapter 3. Let me begin reading at verse 1 in Titus chapter 3. I'll read verses 1 through 7, and we'll get into our study. Titus chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 7. Paul writes, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so let me review a few things and develop a context and an introduction here to uh, the study that we'll be looking at in chapter 3. Remember in chapter 2, Paul had given instructions to Titus concerning how believers are to live. And so he wrote to the older men, to the older women. He wrote instructions to the younger women, the younger men, and he wrote instructions to slaves. He also had written to Titus and instructed him that he was to live as an example to the churches. Remember in chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, I'll read it to you. He had said, in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. And so he was to be a pattern of good works. That was so that people would be able to see what faith looks like. It was to be an example of, what, uh, of, of faith in action. As a pastor, as a pastor teacher, he was to be an example of what was called good works. The word good there speaks of that which is excellent or righteous. His life, in other words, was to be a true pattern of what he was preaching and what he was teaching. It was to be such a pattern that people were to follow him. Again, it reminds me of Paul writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, where he had said, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Also in Philippians 3, verse 17, how he had said, join one another in following my example, brothers, and carefully observe those who walk according to the pattern we set for you. So faith is modeled. Faith is not something that is simply expounded upon or spoken of. Faith is modeled. And Titus was to be an example. He had already given instructions to the older men, to the older women, younger women, younger men, slaves. He had given instructions. But he says to, uh, to Titus, you need to set the pattern. You need to be the template. You're to be an example in doctrinal integrity. Because the false uh, teachers that were entering in were bringing in bad doctrine. And therefore, in contrast to the false doctrine that has been spread in the church, your doctrine is to be true, and the purity of your doctrine is going to be demonstrated by the purity of your life. So your life is to evidence reverence, revealing a life that honors God, a life that is dignified. Now, that word dignified, in earlier days when I thought of dignified, I, I, I didn't really have a good grasp of it. I, I thought the word dignified kind of was like being stuffy. I don't know another way to put it. I, I thought of it as being kind of, uh, you know, never laughing, having no sense of humor. Uh, but that's not what the word dignified actually means. Uh, dignified speaks of knowing the difference between things that matter and the things that don't. A person who is dignified knows what is trivial and what's important. And so sometimes we can get caught up with the things that are trivial. So Titus be an example of somebody who knows what is important. Because when you become that example, the churches that you're ministering in, the elders that you're influencing, can see your example 
and understand how a man of God is to live. He used to be sound in speech. When he speaks of being sound in speech, it, it refers to the way that he speaks in normal conversation. It's not simply referring to his doctrine when he's teaching, but it's how he speaks when he's not teaching. It's the things that he's saying. So be sound in speech. The word sound is a word that can also be translated healthy. The words that you speak ought to be life-giving words, in other words. So guard your speech. Be careful that uh, what you say is appropriate, and, and be careful that what you say, Titus, because people are watching you, be careful that they're edifying. In Ephesians 4, verse 29, uh, Paul said it like this. He said, no foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. You know, there was a, a trend going, perhaps some of you might have been witness to it, seen it, heard it yourself. It was a while back, I don't know if it's continuing today, but it certainly was a while back, where the pastors thought it was kind of, kind of um, connecting with people to, uh, to, to swear from the pulpit. And so they were using profanity, and, um, and that, that occurred here on a couple of occasions. Somebody used profanity in my pulpit, and I spoke to them afterwards. It's been a few years. I won't mention names, John. I won't mention names. <laughs> yeah, I won't mention names. But I had a talk with that with a brother, and, and I asked him, I said, you need to remember that, that the pulpit has been called the holy table. And that when the word is spoken from that, it ought to be words that are sanctified, those words that are edifying. Because it isn't proper to use improper language. And so I've seen that firsthand. And uh, sometimes people have, have thought that in using a particular way of speaking, that they're connecting with people. But I discovered a long time ago, and Paul's words have applied for all these years, I, I discovered a long time ago that the word that we speak ought to be edifying to the hearer. And that's what Paul is saying to Titus here, that the words that are spoken, not simply from his teachings, but from his way of life, ought to be bringing edification to those who are, who are hearing what he says. And that is the way of speaking that, is, that would be the, um, the, the mark of a truly godly man. Now, the reason for these high standards held by all of those mentioned is really practical. Uh, it may cause opponents to be ashamed because they make untrue accusations. And a person who's making an accusation should be embarrassed because he knows that what he is saying isn't true. And these are the kinds of lives that impact the world that we live in. We're living in a lost, a fallen world that is rejecting its moral foundations. As I was preparing this Bible study, I thought that I would develop an introduction that leads into the practical teaching in, in chapter 3 by, by bringing this out, saying something we all already know. We're living in a lost and fallen world. We're living in a nation that has rapidly rejected its moral foundations. The question is asked in Psalm 11, verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, our own nation has rapidly forgotten its moral underpinnings. The masks that people wear because of COVID aren't the only masks that Americans wear. Many Americans wear a different kind of mask. Many Americans wear what we would call a, a religious mask. Religious masks are worn underneath it all. It's really anti-Christian beliefs. We see this, and I'm not going to go too far into this, but it does lend itself to our introduction. We see this in the passing of laws and the decisions that have been made by our judicial system. An example is found in what has happened since Prop 47 had been passed. It reclassified certain theft and drug possession offenses as misdemeanors, and those who were sentenced prior to its passing could actually petition for resentencing, and the law made some nonviolent property crimes 
where the value does not exceed $950 into misdemeanors. And in the last 11 months, more than 4,300 state prisoners have been released. Because stealing less than $950 worth of goods is a misdemeanor, theft has risen. At one time, stealing was understood to be wrong by the majority of society. But our new law undermines this moral and cultural understanding. I remember, and yes, this is ancient history, but it's true. It's part of my life. That when my father would send me to the store on Sunday mornings, we lived only about 300 yards from a convenience store. It was right at the corner. So my dad would give me a quarter. That tells you how long ago this was for the Sunday paper. And I would go to this particular store just straight up the street. I'd take the quarter and I would, uh, I would lift up a stack of newspapers because they'd be stacks outside. They weren't inside of any kind of lock devices. They were set outside. And I would lift up the uh, newspapers and it, I would drop my quarter on a pile of quarters. And I'd take the paper and go home. You didn't think about just taking those quarters and stealing them. Imagine doing something like that today. You can't obviously do that. You could leave your bicycle out at night in the front yard, and it would be safe. You could sleep with the window open, and nobody was climbing in. There were so many things that were so different than it is today. The moral underpinnings of this nation have been rotting away for a number of years to the point where the nation that I live in now is almost unrecognizable in comparison to the nation that I grew up in. And so we've seen this moral demise occurring for quite some time. We, we know that the new laws that are being passed undermine moral and uh, cultural understanding. And here we need to remember that in the United States there was actually a revival that occurred in the late 60s and early 70s. And, and it, may find, it may be interesting to some of you who are young and all that uh, initially this Jesus movement revival was actually accepted by the, the people in the nation. It was, it was not initially responded to with a lot of negativity. It wasn't. Because we lived in a nation that, that in many ways hadn't rejected its moral underpinnings yet. We had gone through the crazy 60s and all, but when the Jesus movement came, there were people who were actually relieved to see that because the youth were actually changing and the nation was once again becoming a better place to live. But what happened is laws were passed legalizing sins that Christians had been opposing for centuries because at first this revival was accepted, but later it was met with hostility. Even recently, the legalization of marijuana, the decisions that are favoring homosexuality, these things have been enacted, and general acceptable conduct in society has been degraded. Profanity and crudeness is not only accepted, but it's actually defended. Immorality and teen pregnancy, venereal diseases, living together is on the increase, and it seems that justice has been turned upside down. Calvary Chapel, San Jose, has been fined $3.8 million because they have conducted church services. But congressmen who have slept with a Chinese spy or a president's son selling influence, there's no major news outlet willing to call it out. That's the society that we're living in, and that has caused many Christians to become angry and many Christians are frustrated. One commentator said this, many well-meaning Christian leaders have decided it is time to stand up for their rights and have declared war on the prevailing non-Christian culture. They have become hostile to unbelievers, the very ones God has called them to love and reach with the gospel. Believers are to be aware that we are not called to make superficial Christian America. John MacArthur said, when Christians become political, sinners become the enemy instead of the mission field. Now remember, in Paul's day, there was no cultural Christianity. The world that Paul lived in was filled with sin. It was filled with idolatry, prostitution, slavery, homosexuality, homosexuality. 
And Paul didn't instruct believers to protest. He instructed believers to preach and to live a powerful message. And he combated the corruption of Cretan society by instructing Titus to remind the church, remind them of what they've heard, remind them of what they have believed, because in reminding them of what the gospel has done, it will save them from becoming bitterness. What is it that they heard, and what is it that they believed? Well, Titus 2.14 tells us that Jesus gave himself for us, and that's the overwhelming testimony of Scripture. Jesus repeatedly stated that he would voluntarily lay down his life for us. And such a thought in this modern world is difficult to comprehend. I read a comment made by a 23-year-old man. His name is Scott. And he said, I think it's mighty arrogant for us to assume that if, if an ultimate being exists and did create the universe, that they did it for us. What in the world could we possibly offer a God with this power? Why would he be so concerned with a race of gnats as ourselves? Well, that's a great question, isn't it? We do not assume that an ultimate being exists. We know that he does. And we also know that he created the universe, but it wasn't created for us. It was created for himself. In Revelation 4.11, it says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. Proverbs 16, verse 4 says, The Lord has made all things for himself. So the reason that he's concerned with this race of gnats is because he loves us. That in and of itself, I believe, is amazing. In 1 John 4, 9 and 10, it says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not that we loved him, but that he loved us. That's amazing. And out of love for us, God sent his Son, Jesus, to give himself a sacrifice for our sins. In John 10, 17 and 18, he said, My father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. And this command I've received from my father. He died in demonstrating his love for us, but he also died to satisfy the justice of God. In Romans 3, 25 and 26, it reads, God set forth Jesus as a propitiation by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. When it speaks of God setting forth Jesus as a propitiation, the word propitiation is a word that speaks about settling his anger. God has anger. Jesus has settled it for him. Jesus satisfied his righteous anger, so he sent his, his son Christ to die on a cross to, one, demonstrate his love for us, but two, to also satisfy his justice. So when Jesus died on the cross, he redeemed us by his blood. He cleansed us from sin. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And the result? God now has his own special people, zealous, he said, for good works. In Ephesians 2.10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so Paul has been commanding Titus to speak these things, to exercise pastoral authority. What is he to do? Well, he's to remind them. In verse 1, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. What is he to do? Remind them. People today are not necessarily opposed to all authority, but approach authority very cautiously. Even as I mentioned a moment ago, politically it's difficult to find politicians who truly do have integrity. But the Christian message will be ineffective 
if it's not lived out. And so we teach proper submission by our examples. In Romans 13, verse 2, it says, Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Well, do what is good, and you'll have praise from the same. In Matthew 22, 21, Render, therefore, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And so we are to yield to authority. Therefore, verse 1, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities and to obey. Here's the exception, and we're all looking for that, aren't we? What is the exception? The exception to such a command is a simple one. We do not obey when we're commanded to do something against the commands of God. We don't obey. In Acts 4, 19 and 20, when commanded to stop preaching, the apostles said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. In Acts 5, 29, they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So when the government imposes its rules on the believer to circumvent the obvious word of God, that's when we have a right, even an obligation, to reject that. Because we have a higher authority that we answer to than a president, a governor, a mayor, or whatever. And so that is an exception. And so it's not that we should be looking for these opportunities to, to oppose. It simply means that we need to be aware that when it begins to go against the commands of God, then we will obey God rather than men. And we don't have to do it in a way that is belligerent. We don't have to do it in a way that seems to be like we're picking a fight. We simply do it because we'll, we obey God rather than men. We're going to meet. And so when everything, everything was shut down, and, uh, and we, we followed, we followed the, the rules because we didn't know what was going on with this, with this virus and all. I'm certainly, as a pastor, not going to put any of you in danger. I'm not going to place you in a position where uh, you may get, get a virus, that, and, and I'm the one who put you in that position. And so what we did is we decided to follow what we were told. You all know that, those of you who are part of this church. You know that. And we did for a while. And then one day I came out here, and I was in the parking lot. I was coming every Sunday. This church was still open. You just didn't know it. And so my wife, Marie, and I, John, some of the guys, were out in this parking lot every Sunday. Even from the day that we said we're closing down church services, we're still there. And people started rolling in. And I started talking to them. And I had wonderful time. We had wonderful times ministering to people. My secretaries were coming, and they were bringing Marie and me coffee and donuts. And we're just having a great time in the campus, you know. And anybody who showed up, we ministered to them. And we had chances to pray with and minister to people in a very special way. And then, but I'm not saying anything because I'm not thumbing my nose and saying, look at me. I just wanted to minister to anybody who needed ministry. That's what I'm called to do. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what we did. But then people found out and a parade shows up. And we had a parade of all these cars that came through here. Those who knew, they came rolling through. And they're honking horns and they have signs. We love you, John, and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like your handwriting now that I think about it. <laughs> and, you know, we, we were touched by that. And so Marie and I, we walked up to the people and, hi, it's nice. And they started parking. And now the parking lot is starting to have a number of cars. And I'm looking at them and it was hot. Remember, it was hot. And this room was open. So I said, let's just go into the chapel. And we did. And Jared, I said, go get your guitar. And Jared went and got his guitar. And he started leading in worship. And people were scattered around. We weren't saying sit next to each other. They scattered around. I gave a devotion. And it was, it was, a, it was a blessing. And what are you going to do next week, Pastor? I go to this church. Next week, more show up. Next week, we're inside the main sanctuary. No, I'm not putting it on Facebook. Look at me. You know, see what a brave man. I'm rebelling. I'm an... 
No, I'm just a shepherd who wants to take care of my sheep. And if my sheep show up, I'm going to feed my sheep. That's how it works. That, that's how it works. And so, no, we didn't aggressively want to combat. No, I didn't want to send a message to, to Governor Newsom. He was too busy at the French Laundry to care anyway. <laughs> we, we didn't want to do that. So, no, I, 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 I believe what Paul is saying is absolutely right, subject to rulers and authorities to obey, and we did, and we still do. But when it comes to obeying, we ought to obey God rather than men. And the first thing God said is not good. It is not good that the man should be alone. God created us for fellowship. And to tell us to not have it is to violate what God commanded. And that's why we went that direction. That's why we do those kinds of things. As a younger pastor, I had the opportunity to go to China, and China at that time, we're talking about a number of years ago now, China was very close to Christianity. The churches had to be registered with the government. They didn't have Bibles. And so a friend of ours had, had set up something to bring Bibles into China. And, and we did that. We brought suitcases of Bibles, took a team in, and I still remember going through the line entering into Beijing and um, bringing in these Bibles and we put them down and it was done in such a way that those who were there to get the Bibles were able to take the Bibles. I still remember some people standing over one of the suitcases that was filled with Bibles. A couple of the couriers were going to pick them up and deliver them to house churches. I still remember seeing them with their hands folded in front of them looking down at the Bibles, weeping. They knew what was inside of those suitcases. They knew it was God's word, and they wept over it because we Americans have so many Bibles. I have one in my pocket. I carry one. We have them all over the place. They don't have any. What they were doing was cutting out pages of the Bible and giving these pages to members of the church. And they would tell the members of the church to hold on to this because I'm teaching through this book here. So I want you to have this chapter here. And that's what they do. And then they would collect those things together when they were having church services. I met a man, his code name, I can say now, it's been so many years, I'm certain he's with Jesus now. He's an older man then. But his name to me was Panda. And I met him in a park in Beijing. And while I was there, he came, I sat down on a park bench. It was like 11 at night, 10, 11 at night, empty park in Beijing. But there's so many people who are spying on you. So I sat on a bench, and he came from out of the darkness, came and sat next to me and began to share with me his testimony. Just looking forward, and I was looking forward when he was saying I had seven children. And when the revolution came, because I'm a pastor, they arrested me, he said, and they put me in jail. They kept me there for 20 plus years because I'm a preacher of the gospel. He said, when I got out, all of my children who were babies, young, had grown up into adulthood. Out of the, six, out of the seven children that God blessed me with, because he was unusual, you only have one child in China, but he had several he said, out of the seven children I had, six of them are followers of Jesus, but the Communist Party has taken the soul of my youngest. And I'm there listening, and I'm thinking to myself, we Christians, we Christians have it so easy in comparison. That kind of government may very well fall upon us if we're not careful now. And so, yes, we do obey the government. Indeed, we do. Christians ought to be the most loyal and best citizens in the nation. But the only time that I will refuse is when the command is to disobey God. We ought to obey God rather than men. And so he says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities and to obey, to be ready for every good work. When he says be ready for every good work, be ready to do good to the people around us including the sinful, as God gives us opportunity. 
no matter how hostile they may be, we should be ready to lovingly care for them, is what he's saying. In Galatians 6, verse 10, it says, Therefore, as, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all. And so he's speaking about our conduct living in a lost world. And he says to do good. In verse 2, he says to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable and gentle and showing all humility to all men. So this would speak of how we treat our neighbors. And our neighbors includes everybody, including the politicians that we may not really appreciate. He said, speak evil of no one. When it says evil, speaking evil, that means don't use abusive language. Don't, don't be insulting. When he says be peaceable, it, it means be ready to yield personal advantage for the sake of peace. When he says be gentle, that speaks of showing what would be called a mildness of spirit and behavior. It, it's a kindness in action. He says show humility. Uh, in other words, pride and arrogance are to be forsaken. It's a very unattractive attitude of the heart. So have a humble spirit. Well, why should we do that, Paul? Why would that be important? Why should we speak evil of no one or be peaceful or gentle? Why should we show all humility to all men? Well, he says in verse 3, well, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and, and hating one another. Why? Because we were, we were that way too. We ourselves were once foolish. So we should understand, we should sympathize, because they are as what we once were. That's why they, 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 um, they the ones who are, are being written to, they, they no longer are that way. They're no longer foolish in disobedience. We no longer are foolish and disobedient. Why? Because we've given our hearts to Christ. And so change. He said, your life needs to change. Instead of speaking evil of all politicians and news broadcasters, and it would be easy, entertainers and educators, we should remember what we also once were. Doesn't that help? It helps me. Yeah, it helps me. Oh, I, you, you, those of you who go to this church know I get frustrated sometimes, and you'll hear it. And I really violate, I guess, when I'm not being kind and gentle sometimes. Sometimes I get frustrated, too. But I, I, I really need to remember who, who I was and what I was, because, you know, when I do, it makes me more gracious to other people because I was like that, too. I've, I've, I've been that way too, and I've tried to die to that, and I've tried to grow in the things of the Lord, and so I need to remember what I once was, and, and again, to remember that that's a mission field. Um, those are the lost people. They're living in a lost world, and so we need to sympathize with them. We once were, he says in verse 3, we once were foolish. When he uses the word foolish, that, that speaks of having a, a complete lack of understanding, it means being completely uninformed concerning God and, and the ways of God. We had no understanding of this. We were disobedient. Uh, we at one time also rebelled against the authority of God. We couldn't even obey the least law that would restrict us. And we say, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I pretty much am law abiding. And I say, you, you probably are, except at stop signs, right? <laughs> Have you noticed that stop signs are now suggestions? Have you noticed that? In my neighborhood, I, I, I'm looking constantly to see who's going to blow through the stop sign. Constantly. Because there's suggestions to a lot of people. They just roll right through it constantly. So, you know, we, we say, yeah, we, 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 we are obedient. I'd say, by and large, we are. But not completely, no. At least I've noticed that that is true with me. We'd been deceived. In other words, we believed many things while simultaneously rejecting what God has said. 
When it says we were deceived, that reminds me of Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? We had heard things we wanted to believe, and we were hoodwinked. We were deceived. We, we went in the wrong direction. He said we once, verse 3, served various lusts. When he uses the word lust, that speaks of evil passion. He's saying evil passion ruled our lives constantly. We lived in that, evil passion. We lived in malice. Malice is, an, is, a, is a strong word. It's a, it's a desire to harm others, to see others suffer. It, it's this attitude of extreme, it's been called extreme ill will. It, it, the, another word that has been used for it is spite. You just want to see somebody suffer. And that, that's, that's malice. Envy is resentment. Envy is a desire for the possessions and qualities that someone else possesses. Hateful, that speaks of being disgusting, being offensive, filled with hate. You hate anyone who stands in your way to get what you want. He said hating one another. Well, hating one another is how a lot of crimes, including murder and even divorces and Things of that nature can occur. It speaks of a, a violence uh, against somebody else. That's how violence occurs. He says, that's what you were. Don't forget that, Titus. And, and remind the church that it's through the grace of God you've been saved because this was the way you once were. But, verse 4, when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, uh, Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God, through his kindness and his love, saved us. And he did it by sending Jesus. It wasn't works notice of righteousness, because our works of righteousness are completely insufficient. Isaiah 64, verse 6 says it like this, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. When he speaks of us having our righteous acts are like filthy rags, the filthy rag would be the cloth that a leper who had an oozing wound on his arm, they would wrap it with these cloths. And the oozing of the leprosy, the oozing of the skin that was erupting because of all of the pustules and all, that, that rag that the leper would wear would get filthy through the dust and grime in life. And he said, you think you're righteous? Isaiah is saying, we are, our righteousness is like filthy rags compared to the incredible, brilliant splendor and holiness of God. And you need to understand that. So it's not by works of righteousness which we've done. And what is it that motivated God to send his son Jesus for us? His love, his, his justice. Well, it was his mercy. In Psalm 51 verse 1, it, it reads, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. He did this in his mercy. Now, what was the means employed? He says, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. The washing of regeneration is literally through the new birth. The new birth, regeneration, is what it means when we Christians refer to being born again. You're born of the flesh, and Jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. But you're also born of the Spirit. And the way that you're born of the Spirit is when you confess your sins before God, and you repent of them, and you ask God for his forgiveness, and then by faith you receive the gift of eternal life. And when that happens, you are now regenerated. You are now born again. Before, you were dead in trespasses and sins, Paul says. You had no spiritual life in you. That's why when Jesus was speaking to that man, Nicodemus, when Nick came to him at night, and when Nicodemus spoke to him, 
Jesus said to him, a man must be born again to see and to enter into the kingdom of heaven. How is that possible? Shall a man re-enter his mother's womb and be born a second time? Now, at first, the first time I read that, when Nicodemus said that, I thought, what a, what a ridiculous question. I mean, you, and, and Jesus even says, you being a teacher, you're a teacher of Israel, the teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? Well, I was sharing with a guy when I was in the army, and I said, his name was Rich, and I said to Rich, I said, Rich, you need to be born again. And I'm sitting there, and he looks at me, and he says, what do you mean? Am I supposed to enter into my mother's womb and be born again? Oh, thank you. I said, you know, Rich, that's so funny. Let me show you what Scripture says. And I opened it to John 3, and I read the story of Nicodemus to him. I said, you just asked a question that a man named Nicodemus 2,000 years ago asked. How can a man be born again? How can I have a new nature? I am the sum total of all the days that I have lived. How can I have a brand new life? And Jesus said, you need to be born again. You need to be born from above. And this is what Paul is speaking of when he speaks concerning the, uh, the, the regeneration. That's the new birth. We're born again. Psalm 51 verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Ephesians 5.26 speaks of the washing of water by the word. So when God's word is proclaimed and we by faith hear what he says and we apply it to ourselves, we are regenerated, we are born again, and we are washed in regeneration. But notice also he says the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The renewing of the Holy Spirit. If any man be in Christ is a new creation, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are made brand new and his Holy Spirit now dwells within us. We become what Paul called in 1 Corinthians 3.16, the temple of the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God himself dwells in us. See, I think one of the things people have forgotten in our day is the fact that you need to be born again. There are many people professing to be Christian who believe they are because they attend church services or have received certain rituals. And they believe themselves to be Christians and they'll speak of themselves in that way. And when I was, before I was saved, before I was born again, I thought that way. I thought that being a Christian was by observing certain things, and therefore I had been baptized and all, and therefore I must be a Christian. You know, I'm not a Buddhist, I'm not a Muslim, I'm, I'm not of some other faith, I, I must be a Christian. And then I heard the gospel, and that's when I heard the, the evangelist most clearly, and he said, no, you need to confess your sins. You need to forsake them. You need to turn to God. You need to ask Christ to come into your life. You need to become the, the, the temple of the Spirit of God. You need to be born again. And that's when he hit me. All this time I thought I was a Christian because I did certain things, but I wasn't a Christian because I wasn't a certain thing. I wasn't a believer in Jesus Christ. I was a practitioner on occasion of a religious tradition. And so Paul is reminding him of this. This is, this is what makes you different. And, and Titus, this is what you need to present. You need to remember it's the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. In Isaiah 44, verse 3, we read, I will pour out water on the thirsty and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring, my blessing on your descendants. Jesus in John 7, 38 said, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He has lavished upon us his Holy Spirit. So when you got saved, you became God's temple. If there's anything that I as a pastor want to encourage us to remember it's that without the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to live frustrated lives. You're going to find yourself stumbling into the same sin over and over again. And you're going to start getting to the point where you say, what a wretch, who's going to save me from this body of death? How come I can't have victory? What? Well, the answer is you can have victory, but sometimes what we do is we rely on our own strength. We rely on our own efforts. And, and I came to realize, and I, I realize it often, it's not a final reality with me, it's something I revisit, uh, 
that without him I can do nothing. And so I, I ask God quite often, refresh me in your spirit. Empower me by your spirit. I want to walk in your spirit. Strengthen me in your spirit. Lord, may your spiritual gifts work through me. May the fruit of your spirit be in my life so that I don't counterfeit, have an appearance in, of being a believer and someone who loves you, but in fact, my, my mouth may say things of you, but my heart is really far from you. And see, that's the difference between being religious and being right with God. And so it's through the working of the Holy Spirit that he's poured out on us. Notice verse 7, he says, having been justified by his grace, he said, we become heirs, heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God's grace is the means by which God saved us, and it's the means by which he has justified us, has, has declared us not guilty. We, we didn't do anything, Paul is saying, and he's reminding him, you didn't do anything. You don't do something to deserve his mercy. God has poured it out on you. He has done it even though you didn't deserve it. And now he says we are his heirs. We're his family. We receive our inheritance from him because he's our father. And through regeneration, we've become partakers of his very life. And we are his children. And we can live abundantly because his spirit's within us. And he has regenerated us. And in John 10, verse 10, Jesus has said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's what Jesus promised us. A fullness of life. Not just existence, but a fullness of life. You know, we'll close with one last thought. One of the things that this that the devil, our enemy, does is he tries to convince us that what he has for us is much better than what God has for us. He really does. You know, I, I don't know about you. In my own testimony, very briefly, I get saved. And before you know it, things that I had wanted to have before seem to be offered to be now. And I, I begin to think, how come these things are now being made available? It's because the enemy offers you, he offers you what you think you want because he can disguise it enough for you to think it is what you want. So, but God, I want, I want love. I want to love someone. And God brings somebody, or rather the enemy allows somebody to come around that, that you become attracted to, when in fact, this is a person who isn't going to take you closer to the Lord. This is a person who's going to take you away from God. But here you are thinking, oh, God gave me this person. There are things that he does, the enemy does. They're counterfeits of what God wants to really give to you. And, and it, takes, it, takes, uh, it takes prayer. It takes a, a growth in the word. It, it, it takes an awareness of of the, the value of fellowship. It, it, it takes a, 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 you know, a, a teacher who can help you. It takes so many things. But if you go the right path, if you, if you move in the right direction, if you surround yourself with people who love the Lord and, and those who have been walking with Christ longer than you have, and, and you're open and you share with them and say, you know, I was just given an opportunity to do this, and I'm just wondering, what do you think? You'd be surprised how many of your, your friends will say, nope, nope, that's the enemy, and he's, gonna, he's trying to rip you off, man. Well, you know, you know I, I was praying, and I asked God to give me a girlfriend, and, and this girl, she's hot. I've been wanting <laughs> this girl. Yeah, but is she a believer? I'll bring her to Christ. I'll bring her to church. We'll go to dates. We'll, we'll date. We'll go to church. No, if I stand on the edge of this platform here, it's easier for you to pull me down than for me to pull you up. And that's what's going to happen. Oh, no, God, I, I, I can tell you stories. I'm going to stop because I can. But I can tell you stories of people that I've ministered to who have been pulled down because they thought that what they were being offered was what they were praying for. That's why you need to stay in the word. That's why you need to stay in prayer. That's why you need to know who you are. And you need to know what the Lord has done for you.
Why? Because if you want to impact a world that is rejecting God, you're not going to impact that world by being just like it. There's something different about you. And that's why Paul said that older men, you should be this way. Older women, you should be this way. Younger women, you should be this way. Younger men, you should be this way. And slaves, you should be this way. But Titus, this is how you should be. Why? Because you're living in a lost world. And the things that are in the world are the things that are tempting you. Be aware of those things. Instruct people in these things. Hold fast to the things of God. Why? Because God has given to you the kingdom. And I promise you, when you're in heaven, you're not going to waste even a second wishing you had things you left behind on earth. I promise you that. Everything before you is beautiful. That's why. Father, we ask that you would work in our hearts.